Hello students. I just want to give you a little bit of a hand on how to do the research paper. So you do have two different options, but I'm going to just talk about the iSearch paper here. Um, I know that some of you guys have already done research papers and it's more traditional research paper if you choose the other way, but the iSearch paper is slightly different. So I want to make sure I make that clear and show you guys how to do that. First, the basic prompt. So you're going to combine everything we learned, we've learned so far, and you're going to write a five to seven page research argument paper. You're going to need about four different sources. Um, you will have two different options, right? Like I said, um, it's going to be difficult, but I hope this is going to be fun for you. So here's kind of the inspiration. Um, writing this paper is going to take a lot of time, patience, and endurance. But don't underestimate it. You will complete many different pre-writing assignments and drafts before it is ready. Okay, but I know that you guys can do this. I'm sure that you can. So what is a an iSearch paper anyways? All right. It is a research paper that's a little bit more conscious of its author. It includes a little bit more personal experience. It talks about your questions, your research experience, your reasons for choosing the topic. It still focuses on an argument or something that you wanted to prove or look at in your research question. Um, and you do still need to kind of argue for something though. So with that said, what in the world is an argument? Um, an argument is basically what you've been doing in this class before when we said that uh, the they say, I say. Um, this is your opinion thesis sentence. Uh, what do you need to make an argument? You just really need that clear position, that opinion that I say. You need some background information um, and to consider other people's opinions. You're going to need good evidence. And if you need a little bit more help, um, I'm going to provide these slides for you guys. All right, so what an iSearch paper is not. An iSearch paper is not a reflection, okay? It is not less work than doing another type of, of paper. It is not too informal. So you cannot just do this as some kind of journal or free write, okay? Okay, so how does this kind of paper work? It's a little less traditional, but you're still going to go through all of those same requ required steps of a research paper. Um, the organization will look a little something like this. You're going to need an introduction and you're going to talk about why you chose this topic, why it's interesting, um, and your I say, like, what is the, the question that you're wanting to answer? Um, what it, do you propose about this topic? So, for example, if you chose uh, plastics, you could say, um, we must find a better way to recycle, right? Um, the overview of the topic is the general information about the topic in the background. So, if you chose plastics, you would talk about um, how, you know, plastics became popular, um, plastics, what are and are not being recycled, um, you know, what it, the damage is being done. So all of those major ideas. Um, and as you go through, you're going to talk about those major ideas and thoughts on the topic. So for example, um, if you were going to talk about Ben Adler's article, you could talk about the topic of um, that plastic bag bans don't work right? Um, but if you're going to do it by author and article, you would say in Ben Adler's article, his uh, his idea is that plastic bag bans are not efficient and don't work, right? Um, also, you're going to need some paragraphs that are your opinion, that are your personal idea, um, more about the topic, why your opinion is valid. And then you want some support for your opinion. So you're going to need to use some of those major thoughts and ideas, that research that you use there, you're going to use to support your opinion. Then you will need a conclusion. And um, there can be some personal reflections and stuff like that in the conclusion. Some of you might want a more um, solid template. So this is kind of a general outline. Uh, this will not work for everyone. Depending on what your topic is, it just might, may or may not work. You're gonna have to kind of figure that out for yourself. I am happy to help you if you wanna make an appointment with me or make an appointment with Katie. So it kind of would go something like this, an introduction, that basic information, why you chose this. Um, paragraph one might be history. Paragraph two, establish the problem. Paragraph three, personal experience. Paragraph four, how research confirms your experience. Um, paragraph five, another main point. 
paragraph six, uh, representing the argument, uh, paragraph seven, support for the argument, maybe another a paragraph on support and paragraph nine, maybe some kind of solution or more about the issue or connections. And then paragraph 10, the naysayer. So something like that. Although again, this will not work for everyone. Um, this is kind of the first part of this video. If you already get it, you're like, this makes sense to me already, then you can go ahead and stop the video and um, I will see you online until then. Uh, if you would like to read the paper aloud with me and me kind of going over it, you can do that because that's what I'm going to go ahead and do next. So I am here on the second part of the video and we're going to go ahead and read my example paper together. I'm going to go ahead and click on it. Um, you guys should be able to get a hold of this also. So this is a paper that I wrote last semester to provide as an example for all of you. Um, it's not perfect, but overall it should give you guys the idea. So here is my introduction. As a community college instructor, I have seen firsthand that mental health has been, a, been an issue for college students. Over the years, I have seen many students trying to push through anxiety and depression while working and trying to go to college classes. Even as I, a middle class white college student um, who had every advantage and privilege when I entered the university, still struggled with anxiety and depression. That was over 20 years ago when, I, when life was significantly less complicated and stressful. Today, students are facing never before seen stressors with work, the economy, social media, and the crumbling of many social institutions. As a result, more and more students struggle with mental health issues and community college students are no exception. Community colleges must do more to prove the mental health to improve the mental health of their students. So as you can see, here is my thesis, right? Right here. I came into it with a question of like what can we do to help um, our community college students with their mental health? And then I say that we must do something. So I'm gonna prove that, but I'm gonna add a little bit more of my own experience in that as well, okay? So here I'm gonna actually establish the problem or the background on the topic too. So even before the March 2020 pandemic lockdown, they know that there has been a significant increase in mental health problems among youth, and that includes youth attending community colleges. According to a 2019 general population survey by the US Department of Health and Human Services, out of a group of 600,000 college-aged youth between two, uh, 2009 and 2017, the incident of depression doubled um, from 7% to 15%. Feelings like anxiety increased 71% and suicide attempts also increased, quoted in Twinge. So this uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, study was quoted in Twinge, right? And so if I scroll all the way down here to my work cited, I will actually see Twinge as the first part of the entrance or the um, citation here. Okay, so here's the, the citation. And I put that that was quoted in Twinge, All right, Just so you guys can see how to do that. Um, moving right along. Um, in other words, college age youth were already in trouble even before the pandemic. I began my career as an instructor during this time, and I always noticed a good deal of depression, depressed and anxious students, and each year it seemed to be increasing a little more without major jumps between years. Then, over my years of teaching, I had a few students who experienced mental health crises, but the number of students was overall small per class. In 2019 research, or the 2019 research seems to validate my personal experience. So you can see right here, I'm going to say how this relates to what I was noticing, okay? Um, furthermore, Jennifer Car uh, Cadigan, a researcher for the Center of for Collegiate Mental Health, confirmed my thoughts once again in her 2019 report published in the Journal of American College Health. She reported that average rates of student self-reported anxiety and depression increased over the past eight years between 2011 and 2019, which is what I had witnessed while working with community college students. Cardigan also confirms the slow pace of increase in mental health issues during my 10 plus years of teaching at the community college. 
As I mentioned above, the rates of depression and anxiety among students were in fact a serious and increasing problem even before the pandemic. So I'm establishing that background information before I talk about like how things have gotten worse or changed now. However, the pandemic lockdown seemed to change everything. Shutdowns accelerated the rate of mental health problems among college-age youth. I have noticed that mental health problems among my students significantly increased during the initial days of the pandemic and continue through today. Okay, so it's both my thoughts on the, on the topic, and then I'm going to talk about some of the research that kind of backs that up or relates to it. Researchers also have noted significant increases in mental health issues in college-age students, including community college students, since March 2020. In every class I have taught since March 2020, multiple students have expressed rightfully their mental health struggles. During the spring 2020 semester, between the fears, isolation, and disruption of in the initial days of the pandemic and upheaval of George Floyd's death, my students and I, to be honest, found concentrating on schoolwork while, um, while experiencing such mental trauma was nearly impossible. Many of my students and students overall simply stopped checking in with classes, often blaming mental exhaustion. As the fall of 2020 approached, many students were not mentally able to continue with their education and did not even register for the new semester. Okay. The research appears to validate my observations. So I kind of talked more about my observations in that paragraph above, and then I'm going to talk about the research here in that next paragraph. Um, a recent EdSource article reported on an ACLU of Southern California study of over uh, 1,200 California students' mental health. Um, the study recorded uh, California students' responses in 2020 and 2021. Oh, that was a mistake there. Um, See, so always read your papers aloud because you'll find your your mistakes. Um, in order to compare the results, um, and the results, uh, oh, the study recorded California students' responses in 2020 and 2021 in order to compare the results, and the results were chilling. In 2020, the students most commonly reported feeling bored, stressed, and overwhelmed. This led many students to feel so overwhelmed mentally that they could not even finish classes in spring 2020, which was also my observation. You can see that I put that into my paper about what I had seen as well. Over the course of my research, many articles discuss students feeling isolated. An article from the Harvard Gazette from the fall of 2021 discusses a student a study done by Making Caring Common, which focused on how isolation and loneliness appear to be more pronounced among youth, in this case college-aged people, during the pandemic. The study revealed that 61% of polled 18 to 25 year olds reported high levels of loneliness more than any other age group. So you can see here, I didn't need a quote necessarily for this, but I still did need to cite it. Okay. Um, Richard Weisborg, a Harvard, a Harvard professor and contributor to the study said, I was surprised at the degree of loneliness among young people during the first during the first year of the pandemic. If you look at the other studies on the elderly, their rates of loneliness are high, um, but they don't seem to be as high as they are for young people, quoted in Walsh. Okay, so again, this particular person, um, Richard Weisberg, was quoted in this Walsh, okay? So I actually put Walsh as the person, um, as the source, right? The la that's the last name of the author. And then I write down the person that was quoted there, okay? Um, this loneliness translated to a great deal of stress, anxiety, depression, and mental health issues and crises. Um, clearly, as Weisberg and others determined, the mental health of our college-age youth deteriorated during the pandemic. Okay, and then, I, then I'm going to go over here. As the semesters progressed through the pandemic, more and more students in my classes continued to struggle with their mental health. So I'm going to kind of go into a, a little bit more personal narrative and how it relates to this information um, that I've just presented. Um, I can remember at least two students who confessed to daily drinking in order to cope with depression and anxiety. At least 10 other students informed me in their getting to know you information at the beginning of the semester that they were struggling with anxiety and depression and currently seeking treatment. 
And then there were the two students that I had to refer to emergency mental health services because they confided that they were actively contemplating suicide. Those were just a few serious cases. Every week, multiple students told me how difficult it was just getting through the day, trying to do schoolwork and jobs. In the matter of one year, I had more students needing mental health resources than I had ever, or than ever had than I ever had in my decade and a half of teaching at the community college. In addition, the enrollment at community colleges has significantly dropped and we cannot exclude students' mental health as one of the contributing factors to that decrease. And I put Burke here because that was not my idea. I, I didn't write it exactly like she did. Um, it is not a quote, but the idea even came from her. So even if it is an intellectual idea, it is property, right? It's intellectual property and I need to cite that person. Um, again, my experience with my students was not um, isolated. And so I'm going to go back to how the research backs that up. The research also confirms this, that in the same report mentioned above, compiled by the a oh, did I go back? Yeah, the ACLU of Southern California and conducted at two separate times, 2020 and 2021. By 2021, students began reporting more feelings of being overwhelmed and anxious. Students responded with words like tired and stressed instead of words like uncertain, confused, and frustrated, which were the common responses in 2020. By 2021, 63% of students had experienced a meltdown in the past year. 43% experienced panic or anxiety attacks. 22% of students reported being unable to attend a class for three or more days because of mental health issues. And even 19% had suicidal thoughts. Sadly, these numbers ring true for my students also. So I'm going to bring this back home again. Um, furthermore, a Gallup poll just released in uh, April 2022 further validates the supposition that college students are dropping out of college or not signing up at all because of mental health issues. An EdSource article breaks down this very survey, revealing that for students who have considered dropping out, by far the most cited reason was emotional stress, with 71% seeing that was among the most important factors leading to them considering withdrawing. And the most alarming thing about this is that answers to the same poll last year showed that only 42% of students considered dropping out did so because of emotional stress. Uh, this was especially profound for community college students. A recent study uh, uh, reported, um, and you can see I put Calc Brenner et al. because that means that there was multiple different authors. All you need to do is put the first one, and it's important that you put the first one. You cannot just put any of the authors. It has to be the first one because that person, for some reason, was put as the first author for like a, something particular, right? There's a reason why. Um, so Gallup poll... Where were they? As well, first generation college students, first year students, and underrepresented um, groups, right, also suffered the most. Um, the Gallup report says it best students are still struggling with their well being, and it's posing a significant risk to their ability to complete their degrees. Clearly, college students, and in my experience, um, community college students need better and more mental health help, and they need it now. You see? I get all that background information to prove that they do need better mental health. And now I'm going to talk about like how we can do that. Um, we know that community college students, um, especially uh, or college students, commu especially community college students need more mental health resources. However, many students either are not accessing them or the resources are not available for the students to access. I know that in California in particular, or that I know that California in particular tried to prepare for this increased need, but in many ways failed. So I'm going to talk about how they failed, right? We know that this was a need, but it didn't actually happen as well as it should. Um, while money was allocated during the pandemic to increase mental health services and access for California college students, more than 80% of students said they did not have, incre have increased access to mental health services at school or elsewhere during the pandemic despite California's push for increased youth counseling services at schools, community clinics, and other settings. On El Camino's campus, I did see an increased push to help students find mental health resources, but many students were obviously falling through the cracks. So again, I show that research, I show what's happening, and I do connect it back. So that's the thing that's making it an eye search paper. This brings me to my research question. What can community colleges, California community colleges, do to ensure better, better mental health for our students? And actually write my research question. It's okay to go ahead and put it in the first person like this here. 
Um, it turns out that there are many options that community colleges are not fully utilizing. A 2021 article on how community community mental health services responded to the pandemic provides interesting and viable options for extending services and community and resources for community college students. Um, an article, the article author Keplovich suggests a continuum of service service de uh, delivery methods. As the figure below demonstrates, the strategies suggest are suggested are more telehealth services, digital interventions, community outreach, clinic-based services, and encouraging natural support systems already present in their community patient their community patients' lives. So there's kind of a continuum. These are all the things that we could do, right? So I found an article that was related to the whole community, and then I applied those ideas to the community college. So sometimes you're not going to find something that perfectly fits for you, but there is that, that idea, and then you can apply it to the area that you're talking about. Okay, we know that California has significantly increased funding for all these services, but it has simply... Um, but it simply has not been enough. Even on our campus, mental health services have increased with the use of telehealth and the like, but still many students suffer. First, in order to better serve our students, we need to fund the expansion of resources for students. So I actually propose a solution here. And you don't have to do problem solution, but for this, it works, right? This means more counselors, more telehealth, more outreach, and more clinic-based appointments. A major part of this is targeting the most vulnerable groups, which means reaching out to students least likely to look for help. And so I'm going to actually combine my idea, this is the I say, with the they say with that research to help support that, okay? Um, this is becoming a lot more kind of at this point like a traditional research paper, but I'm still kind of adding my experience in there. Um, okay, so a major part of this targeting is the most, most vulnerable groups, right? This includes um, making underrepresented groups, minorities, first-generation students, students with disabilities, undocumented youth, and LGBTQIA plus um, priorities for mental health services because underrepresented racial and ethnority, ethnic minority first-generation students reported a relatively lower sense of belonging compared to peers. These students need greater and faster access to these resources. As Burke's EdSource article and many other articles demonstrate, the state is aware of the problems and working towards increasing the budget and number of counselors to aid in this problem. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about a possible another specific um, solution. Since some of the obvious methods of helping students with their mental health are already being addressed by at community colleges and in the state legislature, I want to focus on one solution that I don't see many campuses addressing, but it is ubiquitous in the research. The largest barrier to a more mental healthy, mentally healthy students population is the lack of what Keplovich in their article on community resources call natural supports and warm lines. Natural supports and warm lines are the members of a student's community and other people and organizations in their lives already that can provide support when they are in mental distress. The Keplovich et al. article refers to this method as leveraging all supports and recommends using these natural supports as a means to extend the reach of the clinical team. They suggest using the patient's families, churches, and other meetings and groups to help community health patients maintain mental health treatment and counseling during difficult times, such as the COVID-19 shutdown. Because students respond best to other students and peers, this model could easily extend to community colleges. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to kind of my experience and an article that I found um, that talks about this very thing that was mentioned in other articles. So during my research process, I discovered that much of the research focused on this idea, the idea that peer-to-peer -peer referral model is the most effective and the most uh, lacking in most colleges and by extension, community colleges. The most interesting and convincing research came from Michael Kalkbrenner at all a mental health literacy approach to supporting first-generation community college students' mental health, the Red Flags Model, published in the Community College Review in July 2021. So the research partially considers the influences of COVID-19 pandemic on co community college uh, students and mental health. 
In essence, the study followed a mental health literacy program called RED FLAGS, which stands for an acronym to remind students of the warning signs for mental health issues. The actual words of the acronym were not listed in the article. So again, you can see how to use um, parentheses. If you're not using them for citation, it should only be for something that is not really that important, um, that is just uh, added information like that. Um, students who gained this kind of mental health literacy were more likely to refer peers and help them find mental health services by a factor of 1.34. In other words, students educated about mental health were over 100 times more likely to refer friends and peers to mental health services. This seems to be where mental health services fall, severely fall short in California community colleges. After working at California community colleges for a decade and a half, and a half, I have seen, I have never seen any uh, college implement a mental health literacy program like the one discussed above. And then I'm kind of going to throw it out there. Um, like the what if this happens, right? What if every classroom had posters on mental health red flags? Every schedule had an easy to find and accessible listings of mental health red flags and resources on how to help your peers. What if every teacher talked about mental health warning signs in their syllabus and on the first day? What if every club encouraged their members to know what the mental health warning signs um, are and instruct their members on how to get help for themselves or peer or friends? Um, Michael Kalkbrenner at Alt's research confirms the predictive validity for promoting the peer-to-peer -peer referral to mental health services, um, meaning that not only could this type of program change the campus culture and help fight stigmas against mental health, health services, but we could assume that a program like, the, like, it, like it could fit our particular college's needs. Um, and would also yield success. This is the direction I think that community colleges need to go in if they want to see real results and improve mental health outcomes for community college students. And I bring it back to my experience here again, okay? Now, I'm gonna go for the naysayer for that counter argument. Now, some might say that this type of peer-to-peer -peer program would be too costly, and yes, it would cost money. However, the state is already spending money and ramping up its mental health services and education, so some of the money and counselors could be directed into this type of program. Also, I propose that the cost of not doing something like this, um, a program with strong research-based evidence, is too steep. Too many students are suffering, dropping out, and even committing suicide because of the lack of mental health services. We cannot afford not to do this for our students, our youth, our future. Another issue might be that peer referrals could backfire and flood the system. More counselors would have to be hired to do this, but the state is already in the process of doing of doing this very thing. Michael Kel um, Kalkbrenner, alt at Alt's model encourages the use of peer counseling in order to help disperse the number of students throughout the system and direct the neediest students to licensed counselors. In all, this is something that our college could easily do. Um, in the past two and a half years, I have seen my students endure a crisis, a crisis that few have ever experienced. So I'm going back to that conclusion now. Um, which has been co compounded by the mental health stressors of the economy, education, job security, caring for family members, gender, and so much more. These students are our future and they deserve so much more than they are currently getting. We have the research and programs available to help them. All we have to do is implement them. It is time for the community college to step up and provide the mental health services that our students need. We cannot afford to wait any longer. And here you will see my alphabetical order works cited page with a hanging indent, okay? And I sent you guys a video on how to do that hanging indent. Um, you should have between like five, four, five, ten, and 10 um, different resources. And hopefully that helped. So I'm gonna go ahead and if you are done, you feel like I got this, then, um, then you can go ahead and go. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and start a part three now of the video. So here I am on a part three of, um, of the video, and we already read the paper. If you would like, you can also click on the sample outline, and you can kind of see like, this is how I did mine, all right? So for this third part, 
I would like to break it down for you guys. So um, this is kind of the way that I did it for that paper. And I put the paragraphs there. I am not going to reread the paragraphs. Um, so this is one way to do it. It works for my topic, the topic of the paper I wrote, and it may not work well for yours. You're going to have to adapt and be flexible. So the introduction tells a little bit about the topic um, and or the reason that you chose this topic. And then here I had my thesis of community colleges need to do more to secure the mental health of community college students. Okay, and then there was my my um, introduction. The first body paragraph, I go over the history of the topic, right? So this is what it looked like before, right? Before the pandemic. Um, the paragraph number two, I kind of give my thoughts and observations, what I had seen over those years and that that during the, the pandemic. Uh, body paragraph three um, shows some of the research and talks about whether it validates my ideas or my observations and my thesis or it doesn't. So it is okay if it doesn't. You can actually say that this was my idea, this was my what I proposed, but that wasn't actually true, okay? All right, um, paragraph number four, there were some, um, some personal narrative and um, some connections back to the research again, all right? Paragraph number five, um, it shows how the research again proves or disproves my experience. All right. Um, I'd say, you know, my experience is, is, was not isolated. And I go back to several of the, the research and articles. Um, body paragraph number six establishes the problem and shows a need for solution. OK, so I talked about all the topic before and then I say, hey, this is this is kind of what's happening, um, but we need more. Right. Um, body paragraph number seven, um, I repropose my research question and um, start to ask to answer that question. So any question that you ask in a paper, you always want to answer. Um, next body paragraph number eight, I discuss one solution. Um, if that wasn't what you were doing a solution, you could talk about one idea or another like they say, right? Um, as we move forward, body paragraph number nine, um, per, gives more solutions, exploring options, ideas, issues, depending on whatever your topic is. That's how it worked for me. Um, body paragraph number 10, um, they, it gives more about the solution, the ideas, and then a possible like connection to my personal experience. Body paragraph number 11, it's more about that solution, the issues and topics, but I discuss um, how I think this might be successful, why I think this might work. And then I give that paragraph number 12, which is the counter argument or naysayer. Like, what would somebody say if they disagreed with you? And I go over that. And then I wrap up the paper, which is what you guys are going to want to do with yours also. Um, uh, the other thing I want to say is don't forget a works cited page. Don't forget to cite as you go. And your works cited needs to be in alphabetical order. And the first part of the entry, right, this first part of the entry needs to match what is in your paper. So with that, I know that was long. If you got through all the video, great. <laughs> Congratulations. If you need any help, go ahead and contact me. I'm happy to even just sit with you and do some research or go over some of your ideas. Um, I actually really like doing that. Uh, with that, um, I wish you the very best. Good luck on this journey. And I will see you online.